welcome to the day 2 of master class 2022 and today's topics are very interesting we have gis and conservation by miss benebo jack and the topic 2 is gis and bathymetry and how it can be used in coral reef protection and marine conservation by dr faiza mazhar Hi, welcome to this master's class organized by Women in Geospatial. My name is Benebo, and we'll be talking about GIS in conservation. Let's dive straight into it. So we'll be looking at conservation, the need for conservation, GIS and remote sensing applications to conservation, benefits of GIS to conservation, the future prospects of GIS and remote sensing in conservation. Making decisions based on geography is basic to human thinking. As humans, we are always faced with decision making. Where shall we go to? What will it be like? And what shall we do when we get there? All these are applied to simple events of either going to the store of the major events such as launching a batsphere into the ocean's depths by understanding geography and people's relationship to locations we can make informed decisions about the way we live on our planet GIS the full meaning of GIS means geographic information system geographic information system is an effective tool for managing geospatial information in any kind How does GIS work? GIS is a technological tool. It's a map that displays geographical data in ways that can inform decisions. It allows us to associate data with places. It is used in different industries, ranging from the government to emergency services to personnel to business, and it shows spatial information such as point locations, borders. roads and polygons there's a quote that goes thus the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone will save it well i believe saving our planet starts with you and i this leads us to conservation when we talk about conserving something we usually mean to stop it from running out For instance, if I say I want to conserve my energy, I mean I'm trying not to use up all my energy quickly. So this also applies to the earth. This also applies to the planet. Conserving is the act of protecting the earth's natural resources for current and future generations. So here we have a chart of climate change um, from the period of 1970 to 2019. we can see how climate change has increased how there is an increase in the average global temperature how there is an increase in global atmospheric carbon dioxide from the year 1970 to 2019 also we have a map of a chart of air pollution here same thing we can see there is a drastic increase There's a drastic increase in pollutants in the air, and there's a drastic decrease in purified air. Our water is not left out. We can see that our water is being polluted, as well as the increase, as well as there is also an increase in waste generation and waste management has not been done well. So there's an increase in waste generation over the years. This is a chart showing from 1970 to 2017. So we'll be looking at four different types of conservation: the environmental conservation, the wildlife conservation, marine conservation, and the human conservation. So why do we need to conserve? Why is it important to conserve? What is the need for conservation? Basically, there are three major needs. for conservation to protect the earth to protect wildlife and for human health to protect the earth 
It's no secret that the future of our planet desperately needs to be safeguarded with climate change already wrecking havoc. In our previous slide, we saw a chart of climate change, how average temperature has increased over the years. So in order to pre preserve the earth for future generations, we need to reduce the amount of harm that human activities have on the environment. And we need to support the natural world as much as we can. Nature itself is our biggest tool in our fight against global warming. And through conservation work, we can fully utilize nature's contribution to the mitigation to the mitigation action that is needed to avoid a catastrophic increase in temperature. So everything from tropical forest to our coastline has a part to play in fight against climate change, as well as protecting our communities. So it is important to do all what we can to protect our nature, to protect the earth, and to protect the planet. Secondly, protect wildlife. Protecting wildlife and preserving it for future generation also means that animals we love don't become a distant memory. Some five decades ago, there are some animals that existed then that they don't exist now because they have faced extinction. So we need to protect and preserve our wildlife in order for such, for such not to happen. So how can we do this? We can maintain a healthy and functional ecosystem. We know that some species cannot survive outside their own natural habitats without human intervention, such as in zoos and aquariums. So we shouldn't destroy their natural habitats. We should not destroy their natural habitats. If we destroy their natural habitats, how do we want them to survive? They will be posed with the problem of extinction. They will be faced with extinction. They don't have any choice than to go extinct. So we need to protect our wildlife and we need not to destroy the natural habitats. Furthermore, species that migrate and inhabit more than one natural habitat are also vulnerable. Preservation of this habitat helps to prevent the entire ecosystem being harmed. As more and more species face extinction, the work being done to protect wildlife is becoming more and more important. Some, some species are constantly on the edge of this extinction. We have the work. We need to conserve. We need to stop them. We need to protect our wildlife. So it is important for us to conserve and protect our wildlife. Human health. One pretty big reason for conservation work is the impact that it has on human health in preventing the emergence of new diseases and the production of medicine that we rely upon. Having wild habitats for animals serves as a barrier. It prevents emerging infectious diseases from dumping from animals to humans. Previously, Undisturbed habitats have been cleared to make way for humans and agriculture. This has brought wild and domestic animals together and has helped to jump and has helped facilitate the jump of diseases to human. One such example is the Ebola outbreak. So Ebola is a zoonosis, an animal disease that can jump to human and mostly spread from human to bats. Also, a lot of medicine that we use as humans are also derived from chemicals that are produced by animal or plants. So by protecting nature, we also protect life-saving drugs we rely upon, including anti-cancer drugs. So if we don't protect nature, how would we be able to produce medicine from animals and plants? Simply put, we cannot be healthy in an unhealthy environment. If our environment is unhealthy, how dead can we be healthy. So it's our best, it's in our own interest to preserve the natural world as much as we can. Explo the exploitation of natural world threatens our capacity to provide food and water for the people on earth. And things like pollution are directly harmful to human health. So if we don't save the environment, if we don't protect the environment, we can't be healthy, we can't protect ourselves. This is another need for conservation. So ways of conserving the environment. 
We should create awareness. We should avoid deforestation. We should avoid forest fires. We should always practice afforestation. We're not saying you shouldn't cut down trees, but when you cut down a tree, ensure you plant it back. We must control pollution to learn to recycle. We should also adopt an environment-friendly lifestyle. And we should protect species that are on the verge of extinction. GIS and conservation. Humans are changing the planet and affecting the natural habitats of many wildlife species. Impactful events include pollution, deforestation, which are causing fragmentation and extinction of many species. How does GIS help? How does it come to play? GIS enables conservation professionals to assess and utilize current, historical, and time series information relevant to conservation, including data on species occurrences, ecosystem condition, watershed boundaries, and land use pattern. When using GIS, data are contained in layers that can be overlaid with one another to identify relationships between wildlife and landscape pattern. So basically, GIS provides conservation professional the access to data, current data, past data, real-time data. These data are needed for conservation experts to enable them, to enable them device strategies, to enable them, to enable them implement strategies for conservation purposes. So data is key. So they need data. Without data, we can't, we don't know what to do. How do we know how many, how do we know how many um, species live in what year? How do we know the time frame? How do we know the land use? How do we know the land pattern? So we need this data. Conservation experts need this data. So data is key. By incorporating a bit of data types into GIS, conservation professionals can begin to implement strategies to sustain and protect native species. So these data types might include special population and distribution, ecosystem conditions, watershed boundaries, land use patterns. So GIS provides a tool to monitor analyze and visualize data. GIS and remote sensing application to conservation. It can be applied to environmental conservation. GIS can also display and analyze aerial photographs. Digital information can be laid, overlaid on photographs to provide environmental data analysis with more familiar views of landscape and associated data. GIS can provide a quick comparative view of hazards such as highly prone areas and risks, areas of high risk which may occur and areas to be safeguarded. So here is a disaster management map made from GIS and also this is um, an air quality monitoring map which was made using data gotten from GIS. This is also an example of a forest fire rich map using Lebanon. Forest fire hazard inspection in Lebanon. So this is a map using remote sensing and GIS. These are the ways GIS can help in conservation. These are the ways we can apply remote sensing and GIS in conservation. We can also apply it to wildlife conservation. So habitat loss, global climate Global climate change and human disruptions, such as pollution, deforestation, are threats to wildlife biodiversity and can cause fragmentation and extinction. The GIS technology is an effective tool for managing, analyzing, and visualizing wildlife data in order to target areas where conservation practices are needed. So, using GIS technology, we can know where conservation practices are highly needed. Yes, it's not all areas that conservation practices will be needed. There are 
areas that are high risk, that are posed with high risk of extinction. So GIS data gives us such information. So habitat geospatial analysis is an important key to understanding the health of a species in the world. So this is a map of um, regional bird conservation. And also we have another one of track line locations for four male and five female black food albatross. This was um, gotten from ESRI, ESRI GIS for wildlife conservation. It shows how we can use GIS in creating maps for wildlife conservation. And here are also some examples of maps created using GIS and remote sense data. So we can also use GIS and remote sensing application for marine conservation. Marine habitats and the life they contain are threatened by global warming, extreme weather, natural and man-made pollution, over-harvesting, and additional human disturbances. GIS technology is a tool that helps conservationists acquire, manage, analyze, and visualize spatial and thematic oceanic data through map generation. It is used around the world to map marine habitats, what's checked water quality, species distribution, population, and behavior. Also, it is used to check pollution, fishing grounds, and other factors that impacts marine life. GIS is, a, is an important tool for marine conservation. We have listed ways it can be used for marine conservation and it helps, it is, it is a useful tool to check pollution, to check fishing grounds, to check marine habitats, to check the water quality. It does a lot for marine conservation. So these are maps made from GIS for marine conservation. And this was gotten from Every GIS for conservation. So benefits of GIS to conservation. What are the benefits of GIS to conservation? GIS helps users to monitor, visualize, analyze, and understand species population and distribution, how a species is being distributed, and the population of a particular species. GIS also helps to know the land use and land change, how land is being used and how it has changed over time. Community assets, it helps to know how effective conservation practices has been. And it also helps to map out protected areas. Future prospects of GIS and remote sensing for conservation. In 10 years time, in two years time, in five years time, what would GIS, both GIS and remote sensing doing when it comes to conservation. So artificial intelligence is an emerging tool for conservation management, machine learning algorithms, and now being utilized in the analysis of remotely sensed data for various ecosystems. Artificial intelligence and machine language, a machine language now make management and analysis more effective and efficient. This will in turn assist in the creation of effective conservation, policies towards environmental sustainability. Now we use a combination of artificial intelligence, machine learning and machine language to check biodiversity. We use that and we use machine learning and GIS as well as remote sensing to devise conservation practices that would help to devise conservation practices that will help towards environmental sustainability. So AI and Machine learning is the future of GIS and remote sensing when it comes to conservation. So now we'll look at the main elements of GIS. What do we mean by elements of GIS? So one, data input, verification and editing. Here we talk about importing our digital data sets. What are we importing our digital data sets? This can be your remote sensed map. Then the next thing we're talking about is data storage, retrieval and management, how we can store our data, how we can retrieve our data, how we can manage the data that we have imported. So our data can be stored either as a raster format or a vector format. Next thing we talk about data manipulation and analysis. Here we bring diverse data sets together making them compatible, combining them and analyzing them. Lastly, outputs, 
how is it going to be on the screen? So this is where we select areas and layers for output on a screen. Next thing we'll talk about is the GIS map data available to the public. Where can we get data? Where can we get GIS map data? So we can get it from the USGS, that is US Geological Survey topographic maps. We can also get our data for county and state highway maps, national wetlands inventory maps, county soil survey. We can also get um, floodplain maps, county and local natural areas inventory map. We can get it from aerial photographs, sheet distribution, global forest watch, and map of life. But we'll be talking extensively on Global Forest Watch and Map of Life. So what is Global Forest Watch? The World Resources Institute, in with over 40 partners, have developed a groundbreaking in initiative to monitor the world's forest in near real time. And this is called Global Forest Watch. The World Resources Institute and over 40 partners, they have devised a way to monitor world forests, monitor different forests of the world in real time. So the GFW is an online platform that provides data and tools for monitoring forests. So we can monitor this forest in real time. So they use um, cutting edge algorithm to harness the power of satellite technology and cloud computing, and they identify where trees are growing and disappearing. So data that would have taken years to process can now be viewed and analyzed in a matter of seconds. So we are seeing, we are getting this data in real time. We can see where data, where trees are growing, and we can see where trees are disappearing, all thanks to Global Forest Watch. So they provide data on forest change, land use, land cover, climate, biodiversity. So we, we can be contributors to Global Forest Watch. How can we contribute? We can report sightings of deforestation. We can create reports or we can customize map layers. And we can all do this on their website. So once you go to the website and sign up, then we can report sightings of deforestation. We can create maps and we can um, create reports and we can also customize map layers. The next thing we'll be talking about is map of life. Geographic information about biodiversity is vital for understanding the many services nature provides and their potential change, yet remains unreliable and often insufficient. So built on a scalable web platform geared for large biodiversity and environmental data, the map of life endeavors to provide best possible species range information and species list for any geographical area. Map of Life aims to support effective and global biodiversity education, monitoring, research, and decision-making by assembling and integrating a wide range of knowledge about species distribution and their dynamics over time. So Map of Life helps to conserve biodiversity. They, they help to protect, they help to preserve they help in biodiversity education, in monitoring, in research, in decision making, anything special distribution, anything biodiversity, map of life got you covered. So the map of life, they assemble map of life assembles and integrates different sources of data describing special distribution worldwide. And this data includes expert species range maps species or current points, ecoregions, and protected areas. So the map of life features include map species, project species, species by location, indicators, patterns, data sets. These are features that are included in map of life. And of course, we can also be contributors because we have to play our part in conservation. This is conservation of forest, conservation of wildlife. So for conservation of forest, the global forest watchers is there for us. Conservation of biodiversity, map of life is here for us. So how can we be contributors? How can we help conservation? How can we do our part? We can record our sightings and share with others to support conservation. So we can get started by going to their website or downloading the app 
And from there, we sign up and get started and help big conservers. So we have various GIS softwares. We have QGIS, we have Esri GIS, we have Global Mapper, we have Mango Mapper. So all these softwares help us to analyze, help us um, to create maps. They help us to analyze and create maps. And um, we can see where to get um, the software. The website is here below. So in conclusion, as the world population continues to increase, it is predicted that the availability of natural ecosystem for human needs is a serious limiting factor in the future. Since each and every one of us depends on ecosystem life, it is our responsibility to learn more about conserving it. And GIS, as we can see, as we have seen, is a potential tool for planning and conservation. Let's do our own part in conserving the environment. Let's do our own part in making the environment not just habitable for us, but also for the future generation. And we can use GIS as a potential tool for planning and conservation. Thank you very much. So I believe that um, this, we have come to the end of the lecture. Thank you very much. GIS in Bethany, how it can be used in coral reef protection or marine conservation. Today is my topic. We will discuss about it. First of all, what is Bethany? The word Bethemitri comes from the Greek root. Bethe meaning death and Mitri meaning measurement. Basically, it comprises of sounding depth measurement. It includes isometric lines of equal measurement, contour lines, lines of equal height, also bad lines of equal depth. Bathymetric charts. Bathymetric charts are produced by the hydrographic offices. After conducting hydrographic surveys of the seafloor, but actual data is scarce. Here you can see some views. Hydrographic surveys, how they are conducted. Eco sounders are used to acquire depth information. Multi beam eco sounders produce a swath of depth and are often used to map the seabed. Single beam eco sounders only get the depth directly below the boat. Bathymetric data, hill shading can be used to enhance the readability of the image. Predicted satellite bathymetry. Predicted satellite bathymetry can also be used to complement bathymetric surveys. Only a few percent of the sea floor can have actually been mapped, but is far less accurate in position and depth. It is based on the measurement of sea level and gravity anomaly induced by underwater features. Shallow water bathymetry. Shallow water bathymetry from 1 to 20 meter maximum can be inferred from differences in light absorption by water column. Red color is absorbed first, then green, and finally blue. On a satellite image, only very shallow areas contain red color. Habitat maps. We can produce habitat maps by with the help of GIS. Shallow water habitat maps provide information about coral, algae, and seagrass cover. Habitat maps, when available, are used to refine the analysis of survey data. Habitat maps, 
we can compare geomorphological map with the habitat map. The information they provide is quite different. We can compare both layers in GIS. They can provide us different views of the area. What is coral? It is a living organism. It is an invertebrate. Two different types of corals are there, leaf building and solitary. Coral is cousin to jellyfish and anemone. Today, we will talk mainly about leaf building coral. Where can you find coral leaf? Coral is, fine. coral is found all over the world uh, in tropical areas, temperate areas, and coral, polar areas, but only tropical corals build leaf. Coral build leaf. The animal portion of the leaf is called a polyp. The polyp absorbs calcium carbonate out of the water. The calcium carbonate is used to build the reef. Here you can see the example. These corals build. Coral can build three types of reef. First of all, fringing grows close to shore. But next, barrier uh, also grows close to shore but has a lagoon separating it from the shore. A toll, a ring of coral that surrounds a lagoon often grows on a submerged mountain or volcano. Coral benefits from the death of other organisms, yes. Once this happens, calcareous green algae dies, 95% of what remains will be sediment and real estate for new coral colonies. Coral exhibits limited range in growth pattern. Here you can see where they are found. How does global warming affect this trend? Without proper light and temperature, coral can die. Uh, it is called coral bleaching. It only takes one to two degrees in some cases. To change the coral leaves from this to this, you can see temperature increases and competition from red algae have killed much of this coral reef. Growth on reefs are often limited by tidal action. Disease is another major factor limiting growth. Here is an example of Alcorn coral infected by white band disease. An excellent example of a Pacific barrier reef. Here is another view of the Great Barrier Reef, a tall reef in Pulanga. Coral fights, yes, just like other animals competing for space, coral attack each other if they come into close contact. Usually they just overgrow one another, but some actually poison the other out. New home. Corals now have a choice of where to live. Corals are very sensitive and are rapidly dying. People are trying to help by creating artificial reefs. There are some arguments for artificial reefs. It can help to build or rebuild our reefs. It will increase fish population by making new habitat. Arguments against artificial reefs. They are movable. Chemical leaking and leaching into ocean can be uh, happen. It doesn't increase fish population, but rather move them to one location away from their natural habitat, which makes them easier to catch. Here is an example of the northwesterly view of the Flinder Reef in the Coral Sea, about 230 kilometer offshore from Towns while depths are colored red, shallow to purple deep over a deep range of about 50 meters towards Bethamitri. The Great Barrier Reef, Bethamitri. The Great Barrier Reef of Australia are, have, are you can say, extended from um, 
350,000 square kilometer. Great burial reef battery tree. First high resolution map of the entire reef from the world's biggest high resolution satellite battery tree survey. You can see great burial reef of Australia, which are extending up to 350,000 square kilometers. Here are some looks of the island. Great Barrier Reef Petrometry, very high, two meter resolution mapping of Petrometry and sea floor. Here you can see a view. Visualize and explore coral reef habitat with voxel. How we can visualize in GIS by using voxel layers, conducting visual analytics as on subsurface ocean data using a multi-dimensional voxel layer. Coral bleaching is a global phenomenon caused by changing sea water temperatures and other aspects of climate change. When temperature rise above a certain threshold determined by the coral species, corals expel the algae that reside in their tissues and give coral their signature vibrancy and turn white it, if harmful temperature levels are maintained. The algal level is never restored and the coral population may never recuperate from the shock. The stress eventually kills the coral population. How we can use the voxel layer? In the menu bar, you can add and symbolize a multidimensional voxel layer. Next, you will add the multidimensional voxel layer to the scene. Choose a display variable and change the layer's appearance on the ribbon on the map tab in the layer group. Click the Add Data drop down arrow. From the list of options, choose multidimensional voxel layer. Browse to where you stored the data and uh, double click EMU Reef Australia. Then add the layer. You can see here is a view. On the scene, click the mouse wheel button and uh, move the pointer up and down to tilt the scene and to see beneath the subsurface tape. You can also navigate the scene by pressing the following feet while right clicking and dragging the scene to tilt, to rotate, to pan and to zoom. In the content pan, in the elevation sub surface section for ground, turn off world elevation 3D terrain that or terrain 3D. Once you have identified the areas most at risk of bleaching, conservation efforts must be implemented most aggressively in those ecosystems. Conservation relies on strong governance, but is often at the mercy of private interests. Many resource-deprived societies are not able to control their own well-being, uh, let alone their environment, even though their livelihood depends on it. The experts at the reef restoration and adaptation program call for exceptional level of coordination of science management and policy and open engagement with society. Concerns regarding the health of the coral reef has inspired numerous international policy interventions and partnerships. In 2014, in the United Nations Environment Program and Regional Sea Conservation and Action Plan initiated a global coral reef partnership to support countries to deliver internationally agreed upon coral reef commitment to ecosystem-based management of coral reefs. Miss Binibo Jack, her name is Miss Binibo Jack, and she holds a degree of science in geography and planning from University of Lagos, Nigeria. 
She is a research assistant in Biggs Water Shield Science Lab at San Diego State University. She is a marine conservation enthusiast with a strong remote sensing and GIS skills. Her long-term goals include using GIS RS to develop models for ensuring the sustainable use of Earth's oceans. Dr. Faiza Mazhar. Dr. Faiza Mazhar holds a doctorate degree in geography. Currently, she is HOD geography adjoint, adjunct at NSRICINC, National Science Research and Innovation Center, London, ON, Canada, as well as editorial board member of Sci Hall Journal, Applied Remote Sensing and GIS. Open, uh, open Access Canada. She has a strong background in various GIS softwares and has, a, has the capability for a team leadership. Thank you so much for joining day three, day two of Masterclass 2022 and join us and grow your professional network Register for our speaker database and show the world the great work you do. Put yourself out of your comfort zone from time to time. Get mentored and be a mentor and support the community. Speak up for yourself and diversity and be a factor of change. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please join us for day three of Masterclass 2022.